Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode four in a series where I spend 200 hours developing a game in Godot, showing myself and everybody else what could be achieved if you spend a somewhat considerable amount of time developing a game. Now, this episode is quite special because it's the 50 hour mark, which means we're a quarter of the way through. Uh, I've got five big tips for everybody, so make sure you keep watching. If everybody could give this video a thumbs up and subscribe, that'd be much appreciated. But regardless, Let's get into the video. So the first things first, which is my project, it's called the Realm of Runes and Stars, which I generated from ChatGPT. I thought I'd give you guys just a quick rundown of the folder structure at 50 hours and the kind of chaos that's within that and the disorganization. Um, but first things first, what I did try to do was I tried to set the folder color of the different folders, because if you're anything like me, as soon as you start getting more than 10 and 20 folders, things get really hard to track. So I tried to co color coordinate them a little bit and also color, color coordinate similar things with the same color so that when I come to refactoring this later and kind of restructuring it, I can kind of package things together in, in the ways that make sense. So I started off with an assets folder, which was kind of a big dump of everything. So you can see here, I've got my components. Um, some of these components work, some of these components don't work. Uh, but I do have some components in here that I've kind of thrown onto a components folder. Uh, we have dialogue, which is actually just some menu scenes. We have entities, which is all my NPCs, uh, all the animals, all the different things in the game. We got items, which is um, something I was playing around at the start. And then we have kind of like the UI stuff. So we have menus, we have scenes, we have transitions. Uh, we have a folder for singletons, so, you know, we have a quest journal, state, some loggers, stuff like that, that are singletons. We have a folder for that. This is all subject to change. I'm just kind of showing you guys where we're at so far. Um, and then in the root directory, we actually have a few different folders for inventory items, collectibles, different data, different resources, stuff like that, that we're going to use later on to serialize data and save it. We have a big folder for dialogue. So obviously, because this is an open world RPG game, there's going to be a lot of dialogue in here. So having its own folder that we can split out all the different um, different dialogue into helps. And finally, we have a big resource folder, which is huge and just has every image under the sun that I've basically came into contact with. So now that we've got the folder stretch out of the way, I just want to show you guys a high level overview of everything that we've built so far. So for the most part, since the last episode, the basic structure hasn't really changed. We've still got a bit of a small town, a few buildings, and a farm. Uh, but what we have been working on is we've added in some more game assets. So we've had, we have a farmer now. We have some chickens dotted around the place. We actually have two traders that we'll show you in a second. And we also have a giant frog that sits in the woods. Let's open the game and have a closer look at what has been implemented. We'll click start. Uh, the first thing that you'll notice is we have a little hood with the current quest. We have a farmer with a little icon above his head, which denotes that he is a quest giver. I added a little bit of a quality of life thing where it checks the interaction collision areas and will now notify the player if you can interact with that thing. So let's go ahead and interact with the farmer. Major Sanders is his name, and he says, Where in Tara Nations are them chickens? Have you seen them? Well, I'll be. There's three of them scattered around these here parts. So help the farmer collect his chickens. That's the first quest. We click yes. The quest is then started. It's called find three chickens. Obviously, they're not these ones. Um, essentially, there's three chickens dotted around the map that the player has to find. I've moved the speed down a little bit, so that it's easy to catch them. But there's one. The chicken is then added into the inventory. Continue. And we could go find the next three. So, boom. There's the second one. And then I've added a third chicken up here. And upon collecting the third chicken, the quest description will change. And it then says return to Major Sanders. The chickens are in the inventory. Another thing I added was we now have trading. So you see here in the two market stalls, we have traders that we could trade with. So we have gold, they have gold. We could buy and sell items like that. Pretty cool. Quite basic uh, items so far. First, just has a load of carrots. Cool. We could buy, sell, 
We have gold, it's all reflected. About the game state, excellent. Let's return our chickens to Major Sanders and complete the quest. Cool, so here's Major Sanders. Now we talk to him, he says, well ain't you a peach. I owe you a big old thank you for rounding up my wayward chickens. Come gather over yonder where I keep all my investments. There we are, that's the first quest completed. We've talked to him again. Um, he gives some kind of uh, generic dialogue to show that he doesn't do the quest anymore. The final thing that was worked on, which is a little bit under the hood, but we, we have a portal now in the middle of the town, where if you go into it, you're then teleported into the dungeon area that was implemented before. What is different is there is a basic stats implementation under this. So we now have attack, we now have health. These have attack and health. And uh, there's no specific indicators, but I have went down zero, we died. Progress. So my first tip to everybody is be consistent. Now this is the reason that I started making this challenge in the first place, it was just to show to everybody that you don't need to know what you're doing. You don't need to have a great plan of everything. As long as you are persistent and consistent with what you do, you can achieve what you want. Now, how everybody achieves, this is gonna be different. But for me personally, what I like to do is I like to check in every day. So that means I like to open up Godot every day and I can spend five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, one hour in Godot. But that's not the important thing. And what I do is not the important thing. The important thing is that I continue going on. I continue engaging with Godot and I continue learning. So that's my advice to everybody is next time you're watching a YouTube video and you've got 10 minutes spare and you don't know what to do, just open up Godot, start playing around and keep building on that and start creating a good habit. For tip number two, and that tip is failure is good. Now I know, and especially when you start out, that things can be hard and you might not necessarily get things on the first time, especially when you're watching YouTube channels and all these YouTubers and tutorials who show you the perfect way of doing things and they make it look so easy. When actually in reality, it's not. And all these people who know what they're doing and prepared all of these things, they're only in that position because they have constantly tried things, they have constantly failed, and they've constantly pushed through that. So my advice to anybody who's watching this now is next time you're struggling with something and you think that you can't do it or you're not capable of doing it, just know that you are capable of doing it and that all those difficulties that you're facing, they're all part of the learning process. Embrace failure, accept failure, and know that when you're on the other end and you finally succeed, you will be a much better person. So my next tip is set small and achievable goals. One trap that people tend to fall into is they do something and they have this huge idea that's gonna take months and months of development of, oh, I want to make a quest system. I need to make a quest system that can handle every single type of quest and could do everything. Don't do that. Do something very small and work from there. So this is a perfect example. I have a very simple scene the background's very simple. And when I first started it, I just went, okay, I just want to make this guy follow my cursor. Okay, cool. And I thought, nice. Now what do I want to do? Okay, I want to make him shoot. Okay, I make him shoot. What I didn't do was, oh, I want to make a weapon system there where he's going to have 500 weapons, something like that. In the programming scene, there's something called Yagni, which I just put on the screen, which basically means you're not going to need it. Focus on the things that you need to do right now and set them small so you don't get overwhelmed with what you're doing. The fourth tip, this is a little bit of a throwback to the first episode, is game assets are still hard. Now I just want to show you guys something really cool that I've been using in my game. Um, and that is, it's a paid service, but it is an AI uh, pixel art generator. Uh, it's called pixellab.ai i'll put a link in the description if anyone's interested um there are some questions about whether these whether these assets can be used in steam so bear that in mind but i just thought i'd show you guys how you generate a turtle for example so with this ai generator and this is super cool i've drawn out a basic outline of a turtle looks terrible right but 
if I give it a prompt, turtle, and I generate this, will turn my rather terrible, uninteresting drawing into hopefully something a bit more useful. Um, and actually quite a lot of the assets that I've used in my game have been generated through this tool. So the farmer, uh, the frog, there's a mage with certain animations, a few different things. And I just wanted to show you guys how, you know, using technology could actually make this quite useful for you. So as you can see, this is what I gave the AI tool and uh, this is what it's generated. Now, if you wanted to publish a game and use this in a game, there's probably some questions around that. But if you're just someone like me and um, you struggle making game assets, this AI tool is very fun. And now you can manipulate this and do things with this and uh, maybe use some of the other functionality, like try and create some animations out of it. Um, but I found this super cool, super exciting. Uh, I just wanted to show you guys. And the last thing that I want to show you guys, a big shout out to Eltecker, who was in the live streams and was reminding me about this. And that's the, the debugging tools that Godot has. Um, and when if you're not too familiar with these, these can really be super helpful. So what you could do is the debugger is a standard kind of programming debug if you're familiar with it. If you're not, you can uh, break point any point in the code. And essentially the application will stop at that point and then you can check what is actually going on and what what data all the variables have so i've added a breakpoint here on the collection of a chicken just to demonstrate if i go down now and collect the chicken see uh the game is now in a pause state and what we could do here is we can interrogate all the items so we have an object id here which doesn't tell us much but if you see on the right hand screen we have inspector if we click this uh, we can see then the different variables of all the different data and we can go into the, the global stuff and see what all the variables are and just check if data has been passed around properly, stuff like that. Super helpful um, if you're struggling to find out what's going wrong. Another thing in the bottom left here is if you see the remotes, if you click on this, I'll expand it a little bit so it's easier. This will show you the current nodes that are in the scene at runtime. And so if you're having any issue with something not showing or things are showing multiple times, you can click remote and you can dig into what's actually going on into the scene. So everybody, that concludes the 50 hour mark. We're officially a quarter of the way through now. We still have 150 hours to go, which uh, seems like a long time, but also a short time. Uh, I think some of the things that are planned over the next maybe 20, 25 hours are we need to have a great refactor where I go through everything and try and find some good patterns that work and make things look clean. Um, I'm also going to be expanding out the combat and how the combat works with the overworld, all that sort of thing. Yeah, thank you everybody who's watching. I just want to shout out uh, a big thank you to everybody who's been watching, who gives it, who supports the channel, everybody who's been joining the live streams, Adam, Alteca, Kamikaze, all these sort of people who have been helping out with the dialogue, the images, um, really big shout out to everybody and it gives me the drive to continue what I'm doing. So thank you everybody. I hope you enjoyed the video and I'll see you next time.